What we're watching here is an attack on the credibility of, I think it's fair to say, the key witness in this trial. You've tried cases like this. How hard is it to maintain the credibility of your witness who's admitted to criminal activity? Well, yeah, and that's what cooperators have to do. They have to confess their wrongdoing. But the key for the prosecution is corroboration. What can they put in front of this jury to let the jury know that the words coming out of Mr. Gates' mouth are truthful, not just because he says them under oath, but because there are other facts and other evidence that shows you that, they're telling, that he's telling the truth. And that comes in the form of other witnesses, like the accountants, and most importantly, documents, like emails. Um, we're hearing that there were emails showing that Mr. Manafort was directing Mr. Gates to engage in some of this activity, and the prosecutors will hammer that evidence all the way through this trial, through closing, to convince this jury that uh, he could be trusted and the case is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So from what you know, Seth, of this trial so far, have they done a good job in corroboration? Do they have the documents? Do they have the other testimony to try to shore up their key witness? Yeah, it sure looks that way. I mean, from what we've heard and what we've seen, the corroboration is extensive. Multiple witnesses who are saying that they took their direction from Mr. Manafort, that it was Mr. Manafort that was the criminal mastermind. And then you have these emails, as I just mentioned, that show that same sort of sort of thing. And so when, when prosecutors evaluate a case, they do not put all of their eggs into a cooperator's basket. If it's just a he said, he said, and they bear the burden of proof, that is not a triable case. And th that's not at all what it looks like they've put on. They, look, they look like they've put on a highly corroborated case. Mueller's team has clashed repeatedly with Judge Ellis during this uh, process. How does that vote for the case? Yeah, I mean, it, it happens. I think the only problem, it can become a problem if the judge acts in such a way that gives a jury the feeling that the, the prosecutors aren't playing fair, that they're somehow doing things under the table. I can tell you the best and first way to lose a jury, if you're a prosecutor, if they get the sense that you're kind of playing fast and loose with the rules. I'm not saying that's the impression that's been left, but this judge is very active. He, he's not, quick to criticize and even to get personal at times, it seems. So, you know, many, many lawyers, like uh, judges to kind of be umpire or referee and just call balls and strikes. I kind of fall in that camp. But Judge Ellis is a seasoned judge. He's been on the bench for 30 years, and he clearly runs a tight ship. Talking about the jurors, of course, they follow the wider Mueller probe with, about Russia collusion that has nothing to do with this trial. Um, President Trump's name, though, came out repeatedly during the case. Um, how could this have an impact on them? Yeah, on the wider Russia investigation, I mean, I think there are two points. One is that you have this 10-year history between uh, Manafort and Gates and the Russia, uh, you know, Russians and, and Ukrainians on, on the other side. And conspiracies, conspiracies, if one did occur in, up until including the election, don't just fall out of the sky. So this may be a bit of the backstory is why Russians or Ukrainians may have felt comfortable reaching out to the Trump campaign in the months leading up to the election. That's point one. The other point is, I think this trial is everything to do with the rest of the investigation in the sense that the government is trying to flip Paul Manafort. Uh, they're trying to get someone on the inside of that Trump Tower meeting to tell him what happened firsthand. And I think if Mr. Manafort were to lose this case, he's going to walk right into Mueller's office and say he wants a deal. Well, that was my question. Is it getting to be too late for him to turn and really get some advantage out of this? And when he was first indicted, it was speculated by some that that was the purpose here. But at some point, once he's convicted, is, it, is there still room, real room for him to get some lenient? There is. Um, and frankly, there almost always is. Uh, you know, prosecutors have not only indicted him in Alexandria, but they also have another indictment in D.C. I mean, they are clearly putting the screws to Mr. Manafort to try to get him on their team. And if he's convicted, he can walk into that office either after conviction or even after he were sentenced. There are Rule 35 motions, not to get technical, that allow uh, the government to ask the judge to reduce a sentence even after a person is sentenced to jail. So that opportunity is still there. Uh, the deal won't be as good as if he had come in earlier. Uh, and the longer he waits, the worse and worse the deal may get. But they need him, in my opinion, that bad. The government does. And Seth, you're a prosecutor by nature. That all assumes that, in fact, Mr. Manafort has something on President Trump. What if he doesn't have anything? 
Well, if he doesn't have anything to offer, then there's no deal. Um, from everything we've heard and the focus on, it, at a minimum, this Trump Tower meeting, uh, he's one of three people from the Trump campaign that was inside that room, the other two being uh, Don Jr. and Jared. And those are obviously family members, even harder to flip than someone like Paul Manafort. So from everything we're hearing, he was also the campaign manager. And we know now he has all kinds of ties to Russian oligarchs, which may be at the center of the Russia investigation. So, you know, I am speculating a bit here, but putting on either my defense or prosecutor hat, it's not too tough to connect the dots to see Mr. Manafort's potential relevance.